Anyway, if you got your Bible, open to Exodus chapter. We're going to kind of go back. I don't know, probably most of you know something about football. But all the way back in high school, you know, all of us like to play a little football. Most boys do, and the girls know a lot about it. But, you know, kids that age are a little bit uh, show off piece. They want to put a show on, but we'd play football. We'd be do pretty good, you know, two or three games, and then we'd get some confidence. We'd beat a couple of people, and uh, we'd go out and try to do the fun, you know, the fun stuff, the fancy stuff, and show off, try to, and we'd fumble the ball and lose the game. Next day, the coach would have some choice words to say. And after he'd said those choice words, he said, we're going back. He said, it's good to know how to do the fancy things, but you win football games with the basics. And we went out for three days, and we blocked and tackled and blocked and tackled and blocked and tackled until we just couldn't give out anymore. So we're kind of going back to the fundamentals of missions. Just lay something to build on. Uh, I'm not going to particularly speak on missions tonight. I will tomorrow night. But this is the foundation. And everything that every Christian, every church does for the cause of Christ in preaching the gospel to the regions beyond has to start right here. If it's going to be blessed of God and it's going to grow and you're going to see God make abundance out of it and get the gospel out to some people that's never heard it. We're looking at a man named Moses, and all of you are familiar with him. And I'm going to read three portions of Scripture tonight. We'll have prayer. But I want us to look at three things about Moses, and I'll break those down as we go through. But the, I'm going to take out one phrase, and all of you are familiar with it. And I'm speaking basically on this subject, and it's where we'll end up. What is that in your hand? Uh, when Moses was asking questions of God about what he was going to do when he goes back to Pharaoh, and he was, didn't feel confident to do it, God asked him a question. He said, what is that in thy hand? So we'll be back to that subject a little uh, later on in the message. We'll go from there to here. But I want you to look at three things tonight about this man Moses. All three of them are key. If, how many of you here want to have the blessings of God? How many of you want to be used of God? You've got to start right here where Moses did. So let's look at tonight. All of you know the background. Let me give you that, and then I'm going to read three portions of Scripture. We're in Exodus chapter 2. Moses was born in a land called Goshen on the banks of the Nile River. That's where he grew up. At that time, they were under the affliction and the rule of Pharaoh there in Egypt where our brother just came from. He was born and he grew up there and he was under the decree of Pharaoh that every Hebrew child born two years age of under would be put to death because he was trying to do away. The Hebrews were growing so much they were outnumbering the Egyptian people and he was fearful that one day they were going to grow to such a great nation that they were going to overthrow Egypt. So he was born under those conditions. Yet uh, in, in Exodus chapter 2 verse 1 it tells us that his mother and daddy were men and women of faith. And he was born and they saw he was a goodly child. And because of that and their love for God, they were God's people. When he, when he was about three months old, they took him down keep him any longer so they built a little ark of bulrush lined it with pitch and that's another thing but we won't get to that tonight and put it down in the river where Pharaoh's daughter came down to wash herself and his mother knew that and then Moses' mother sent his older sister down to see what would happen when she the little ark floated down the river to where she was bathing herself so the little ark came by and uh, Pharaoh's daughter sent over there to get it and said, bring the little ark to me. He said, what is that out there? I want to know what's in it. As God would have it, she opened up the lid to that and God used the one thing to keep that little boy alive that nothing else in the world would have done. He used that instinct that God put in every mother. He touched a mother's heart because when she opened it up, the little babe was crying. 
She couldn't bring herself to tuck it over and dump it out in the Nile River and drown it. So she took it in, and we don't know exactly what happened, and the Bible doesn't tell us that. But Moses' his sister came down and talked to her a few minutes and said, that's a Hebrew child. She said, yes. She said, do you want me to take him back to a Hebrew woman to nurse him for you for a period of time? Pharaoh's daughter agreed to that. So his sister took him back to his own home, to his own mother and his own daddy. Now, how long he stayed there, we don't know. But it said the child grew. Now, to what point, I don't know, but we have to assume some things. I believe he stayed there with his mother and his father until he grew to the point that they could teach him some basic things about his God, some basic things about God having a plan for his life, some basic things about living by faith. And I base that on the fact that you go over to Acts chapter 7 where it was referring back to Moses in this time. Moses said, I thought they knew that by my hand God would deliver them. So he was brought up with some bringing of some teaching of faith. God has a plan. We're God's people. So later on, they carried him back and turned him back over to Pharaoh's daughter. And he grew up there in, castle, in Pharaoh's castle. And he became known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now let's pick that up where we are. We're in chapter 2 and look in verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, he was 40 years old, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said unto him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said unto him, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Now keep that in mind. He was for 40 years a prince and a judge over them. He said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. Now move over to chapter 3 and verse 1. We're going to say, we're going to, yeah, verse 1. I'm going to show you three things. We're going to read them and go back and review them. Chapter 3 and verse 1, we find him over in Midian. And Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest in Midian. Make a note of that. I'll be back to it. He's in Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. The bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And to cut a little out of the conversation of reading all this, after Moses said, Here am I, after God called him, he said, Moses, I got a job for you to do. Right away, we found out Moses was an independent Baptist. He immediately began to tell God why he couldn't do it. You go down to verse number 10, and God's talking to him and says, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Next verse, And Moses said unto God, Who am I? that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children out of the land of Egypt. And he went on and make a list of excuses and we're not going to deal with those. But turn over to the page of chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thy hand? And he said, A rod. 
And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from before it. The Lord said unto Moses, put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. Now skip down to verse 18. And Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return to my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said unto Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Watch the next phrase. And Moses took the rod of God. Let's bow our heads. And let's have a word of prayer before we bring the message. Father, once again, it's good to be back at Maranatha Baptist Church. Renew fellowship with those that we've known here so many years. Thank you, Lord, for the presentation tonight of this young man that you've called out to go to Indonesia. Pray that you'd go before him, bless, prepare the hearts, Father, of those people. And Lord, we pray that you'd quiet our hearts tonight. Help us to stop and to realize that we're in your presence. I pray, dear God, that you would prepare our hearts and that you would speak to each and every heart here tonight, Father, starting with mine. And Lord, we pray no more for those that are gathered here tonight to hear that word. But Father, we pray tonight that you would warm our hearts, make it easy to preach. God, help us to be clear. Help us to be simple. Help us, Lord, to paint the picture of this man Moses and how he became so great a servant of thine, Father. And at night's end, Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and God, that you would have your will and have your way in every heart that's here tonight. We'll praise you and thank you for it, for we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Like I said, Moses was born, went over, and came the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He lived there in Pharaoh's castle for 40 years. During that time, Moses rode up, to, he, he, he grew up and advanced as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he became the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Pharaoh, ruler of Egypt, literally ruled the world in that day. And here Moses was Pharaoh's daughter. He grew up and history teaches us and shows us without any doubt he was a brilliant man. He spoke at least the Hebrew language. He spoke the Arabic of the, and could communicate with the Egyptians. He was a great man of military might. He led the armies of Pharaoh and won battle after battle after battle and exalted Pharaoh to the very top of the world as being the most powerful man in all the world. He made friends. He had influence. Moses grew up again to be the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And he literally ruled the world underneath a one man named Pharaoh and he had Pharaoh behind him and he had the golden sepulcher of Pharaoh and he could do what he wanted to. Now if you'd consider that just briefly, a young man 40 years old in that kind of position, he had all the influence that any man could ever possibly hope to or dream of having in the world. Number two, he was one of the most, the second most powerful man in the entire world. He could do anything that he wanted to do. He had enough financial resources. He could go where he wanted to go. He could buy what he wanted. There wasn't anything in the entire world because you all know that Egypt is a picture of the world. There was not one thing in the world system that Moses could not have. All he had to do was snap his hand. He had servants. He had everything that you could name. We would put it in the vernacular today. He had it made. We'd say, what more can a young man hope to have than what he's got? But, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I'm sure of this. Moses, during the day, he was happy. He was putting on a front. Everything was going great. 
But when he went home at night and went to bed and the lights went out and there was nobody there but him, I think he was an unhappy young man and I think he got more unhappy and more unhappy and more unhappy as the time went on. Why? Because he, he knew he was not where God wanted him to be. And he would toss and he would turn and he would toss and he would turn and no doubt God was dealing with him and he was struggling with it. How long that went on, we really don't know. But somewhere, and I don't know exactly how it happened, but I'm just pantomizing that it might have happened something like this. He no doubt came to a point where he made a decision. And he went and sat down with his mother. And he said, I can no longer be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now there's so much misunderstanding in this scripture. Let me go back and put it in place. There he is in Pharaoh's castle. And it says down in verse number, uh, verse number uh, uh, 15, said, now when Pharaoh heard this, heard what? That he had slain an Egyptian. Now listen, keep this in mind. Where was Moses? He was the general, the commander in chief. He could have slain one Egyptian soldier and Pharaoh never would ask him why. But here's the problem with the scripture that's so much greatly misunderstood and so vitally important. It said, But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. That's where we picked up in verse 3. So our thinking is, for the most part, Moses lived in Pharaoh's castle. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He went down to visit those people one day and he came back still the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh heard he killed an Egyptian soldier and Moses was afraid and he ran. He fled from his wife life and went to Midian. That's not the way it happened. You say, well, how did it happen? I'm going to share that with you. Turn back over, if you will, to the book of Hebrews. And it'll enlighten us on Moses' life in those early days, and we'll see it in an entirely different light. Remember, he ended up in Midian. He started out in Pharaoh's castle. But somewhere in between that, and we don't know exactly how long, but right at the end of 40 years, he went and sat down with his so-called mother, and I'm sure he was very kind and very gracious and very understanding and didn't want to hurt her. She had been good to him. And he explained to her, and how many words I don't know, but he said, I can no longer live in Pharaoh's castle. I can no longer be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I have to go back out on the banks of the Nile River where my people are in affliction and live with them. That's where God wants me to be. Now you say, where do you get that from, Brother Gabriel? Go back to Hebrews chapter 23, at chapter 11. Pick it up in verse number 23. Start with his mother and his daddy. This is important, and I won't make any more comments on it, but the, his mother and daddy were men of faith, men and women of faith, and that's where Moses no doubt got it from, the seed of it, but it said, by faith. When Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now watch. By faith. Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What did I tell you? He went and said, I can't stay here in this castle anymore. I can't be called your son. I'm an Israelite, and this is not where God wants me. Y'all with me? Now, he didn't go to Midian. He ended up in Midian. He didn't flee to Midian. But it says in verse number 25, it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather not to go to Midian, to suffer affliction with the people of God. Where was that? That was on the banks of the Nile River in a land called Goshen where they were under taskmasters and they were making brick out of mud and slime. And they had been there 400 years. And they were persecuted and persecuted and persecuted. And no doubt Moses, somewhere in his mind, because he had been well-schooled, 
He knew that God had made a promise that he was going to deliver his people after 400 years. Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction than to, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, let me point it out. I don't want you to miss it. It, said, it doesn't say by fear. It says by faith. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he chose, he made a decision to go back out on the banks of the Nile River where his brother and his kinfolk were making slime and brick and were under taskmasters and been treated terrible. When he made that decision, he had no idea what God had planned for him. But I want you to see we're talking about the fundamentals. By the way, let me point this out. Moses is the second most mentioned man in all the Bible. He is mentioned 784 times in the Bible by name. That's only behind King David. 784 times he's mentioned. Where did that start? It said he by faith when he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, refusing, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Do you all see the picture? Later on, after he got down there and he killed an Egyptian soldier, then Pharaoh was mad at him. He was already mad at him because he embarrassed him and embarrassed his daughter and everything else and turned his back on Egypt after he had given him 40 years and made him the second most powerful man in the whole world. And he left him and went back out there to dwell with his brother. And Pharaoh was already angry and he was going to try to kill him then. That's when Moses fled over to Midian. But in between is the most important thing in Moses' life, and it's the most important thing in the life of any Christian. It's called making a choice. Let me ask you a question, provoke your thinking. What was the choice that Moses made? He made a choice between, to enjoy, between enjoying the world and being in the will of God. That's a hard decision to make. Now let me point out why it's hard, particularly it's pictured here. None of us have ever reached the place in this world that Moses was. He had it made. He was at the top of the ladder, but he knew he wasn't in God's will. And he came one night somewhere over a period of nights. He had to make a decision that he was going to be in the will of God. And at this time, keep in mind, he had no idea what was in the future. All he knew, he was going back out there where there was under taskmasters and go make bread. And yet Moses made a choice. And he said, I'll take the will of God. Do you know what decision you and I are facing every day of our life? It's a choice between the world and the things of the world or the will of God. If Moses had made the wrong decision and said, I'll just be a good guy and I'll treat him right and all that stuff, but I'm going to stay here. I got him made. You'd have never read Moses' name. His name would have slid right off the pages of Scripture. You'd have never read another good thing about Moses anywhere in the Scripture. 784 times, 784 times Old Testament. And even the Lord Jesus Christ pointed back to Moses again and again and again. It all started right there one night when he said, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to be in the will of God. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care where it takes me. It doesn't make me any difference. Have you made that decision? You have raised your hand and said, I want to be blessed of God. I want to be used of God. It's got to start right there. It can't start by being saved. You can be saved and not please God. That's right. So Moses made a decision. Let's pick up the second thing I want you to see tonight. He ended up in Midian. Got over there when he was shortly after 40 years old. I'm not sure exactly how many years it was. But he lived there 40 years. He was 80 years old. Once he left Egypt, went over to Midian, settled down, stayed there 40 years. As far as we know, as far as the Scripture tells us, he did not hear one word from God for 40 years. 
Moses went over there. He, he moved over there with the priest of Midian. He settled down there. We can go back over to uh, where we are now in uh, chapter 3. But uh, he went over and he took a wife and uh, he settled down. And he lived there for 40 years. Like I said, as far as we know, he never heard a word from God. Nothing recorded. He got up every morning. He took the sheep out to pasture, sat under a shade tree, listened to the sheep, watching the sheep, went home at night, put them back in where they put them in the sheep bowl there, went in, cleaned up, sat down, ate a good meal, went to bed, got up the next day, did the same thing again. He did that seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, year after year for 40 years. As far as we know, he never heard one word from God. You know what, I got a, an idea. I'm not sure, but I got an idea. He thought he had messed God's plan up and he wasn't going to hear no more from God. And I got an idea, he thought he was going to. He settled down there and got in a state of contentment where he was in Midian. And he figured he was going to stay there for the rest of his life. That God had put him aside because he had made such a mess and killed a man and run off and all this stuff. And he settled down there and he didn't hear a word from God for 40 years. Y'all know what it means to get in a rut? We're in ten How many people from Tennessee? I saw somebody was. Yeah, good for her. <laughs> Tennessee. You ought to promote her. We all know what getting in a rut is. I think Moses got in a rut. I think he got over there, he was excited, settled down there, didn't know what was going on. He thought something would be changed by and by, but did nothing. And he didn't hear from God for 40 years, and he settled down and he got in a rut. Got in a rut. Now let me point out, and I'll be back in a minute. Go back to the scriptures in chapter 3. Let me ask you a question. Watch for this now. When, when did Moses hear from God again? When did Moses hear from God after 40 years? Look in the text, verse number 3. Oh, no, let's go to verse number 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. You ever had anything like that happen in your life? You got your mind, something that's going here, and you're all occupied, and all of a sudden some little something happens in to get your attention, and you just stop. And it's got your attention. Y'all done that? May not be a big thing, just something simple. But Moses, there was a burning bush, and that burning bush came by there, and it was on fire, and that was not uncommon in those days because they was dry, and they burned, and they burned up, but this one bur burned and burned and burned and burned and burned, and it didn't burn up. And Moses said, whew, I'm going to stop and look at that. He said, and I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. Now watch the next verse. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. When did God speak to Moses? When did God call Moses? When he saw he had Moses' attention. Moses had been in a rut for 40 years. You know what happens in every Baptist church across this country? We get in a rut. We get in a rut. I don't mean that ugly. I've been in ruts. But in the, this is a pattern that I've seen over and over and over through 50 years of ministry. People come in, Brother Coffee, you've seen this. They come in, they hear the gospel. You go out and knock on the door. You lead them to Christ in their front room. They trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. They get born again. They follow Him in baptism. They come join the church. They're faithful. They grow, they grow, they grow, they grow. They teach a Sunday school class. They end up a deacon. They do this. They, and that could go on for 10 or 15, 20 years. And they're faithful as clockwork and faithful as clockwork and faithful as clockwork. And if we're not careful, we get in a rut. And that rut is that we assume that we're going to be a member of, of Maranatha Baptist Church. And we're going to teach this Sunday school class. 
we're going to have this part in the ministry. We're going to do this. We're getting, and Baptists get into ruts. And we make such an assumption, God has a hard time getting our attention. God said, when I saw, he turned aside to see. Do you know y'all are all in a rut tonight? Y'all are all in a rut. I can prove it. You've not only made the assumption that you're going to be a member of Maranatha Baptist Church and you're going to do a certain thing at Maranatha Baptist Church and you've got a certain job you're going to work and you're going to live in a certain house and you've got it all planned out and you've gotten set to run now. You come to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, all everything you participate and you just keep doing it. You got in such a rut that you all plan to sit in the same seat on Sunday morning. Come on. I'm not being ugly. I'm trying to make us think. It's so easy to get in a rut. God has a hard time calling us. But he said, when I saw that he turned aside to see, God called him. It's easy to get in a rut. I've been through that. I sat in the same seat, and I'm not being ugly about that. I'm just trying to say, think. And I have to battle with myself. I'm 83 years old. I could easily assume that I'm going to live in the house that I'm living in, and I'm going to be president of Fundamental Baptist Worldwide Mission. I'm going to get up every morning, go to that office, sit down, do this, do this, solve problems around the world. And I have to struggle with that. I don't think God going to send me back to the mission field. But I could be wrong. But I've tried to make it a practice and my wife sitting right there every morning we have prayer and say, God, we want you to take control of our life today. And you order our steps and you guide us. And I say, Lord, I'm where I am today. I believe I'm in your will today. But God, if you've got something else tomorrow, I don't want to miss it. And I give God my attention. I challenge you tonight, number one, make a choice, pour it in concrete, that you're going to be in the will of God rather than enjoy the world. You can be a Christian and enjoy the world, but you've got to make a decision to be in the will of God. And number two, give God your attention every morning and say, God, what do you want me to do today? And don't assume you're going to do that tomorrow. I've been through that. I've been through that, and I'll share it with you in just a minute. So number one, he made a choice. Number two, he gave God his attention. Number three, let's look over in chapter four, and we'll finish up there. I'm going to take this watch off right here and watch it. it. doesn't run. It'll make you feel better, though. Chapter four. Let's look again in verse number two. Moses had said, Behold, Lord, they'll not believe me. They'll not hearken my my voice. Uh, they'll say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. God didn't even address that. He said, Moses, what is that in thy hand? How many of you have heard that phrase before? Most everybody has. Most everybody's heard it preached on, taught on, exonerated, and everything you can think of. What is that in thy hand? And I've made notes through the years. Most of the time, Brother Dale, when that comes up, we think of somebody that has a great ability. they got a great talent. They've got something that, and I've heard people come up and talk to me, and you've probably heard people come up and talk to you and say, Brother Coffee, you know, so-and-so, boy, they can do this. They can play that piano like everything. Boy, if they just give that to God, couldn't God use it? I've heard that about abilities and talents, and those are good. I'm not, I'm not criticizing that, but that's not what God wants. That's not what God, God doesn't need our abilities. God doesn't need our talents. If you've got some, give them to God, thank God for it. But that's not what God, y'all understand me? God doesn't need us. God doesn't need our talents. He doesn't need our ability. He asked Moses, he said, what is that in our hand? And he said, now I'm going to be all right if I kind of add to this thing. I'm not adding to the scriptures. He said, Moses, what is that in our hand? He said, why? Well, Lord, that's my old trusty shepherd's staff. That's my rod. I've had it 40 years. Good rod, you know. God said, throw it down. He said, throw it down? For what? It's been faithful every day for 40 years. Why would I want to throw it down on the ground? 
God said, Moses, don't ask me any questions. I want you to do by faith and throw it down by faith and trust me. And Moses said, well, all right, Lord, it don't make a lot of sense, but I'll throw it down. He threw it down and what happened? It changed. It changed into a serpent. Changed into a snake. And it was a poisonous snake. You say, how do you know? Because Moses kept the flock. And he knew the difference in a poison snake and a snake that wouldn't hurt it, that wouldn't hurt anybody. And when Moses saw that snake, the Bible said he fled. He ran. And as he ran off, God called him back and said, Moses, come back over here and pick it up. He said, What'd you say, Lord? He said, What's snake? He said, Moses, pick it up. Moses said, Pick it up. I, hard to hear. And it's the, he said, pick it up by the tail. He said, Lord, you've been busy running the universe. That's not the way you pick up a poisonous snake. If you were going to pick up a poisonous snake, how would you pick it up? Right behind the head. Why? It leaves you in control. God said, pick it up by the tail. That leaves God in control and He picked it up by the tail. And every time that that rod is mentioned, except one time, every time that that rod is mentioned, it's, it's no longer called Moses' rod, it's called the rod of God. You see, three things happened to that rod when He threw it down. Number one, it changed. Just like that. He threw it down there and it changed. Number two, it scared him. Number three, when he picked it up, it never was the same rod again. It went from Moses' rod to the rod of God. Only one place, Brother Dale, that is not referred to in the, in the Word of God as God, the rod of God is when he was out in the wilderness and God said, I want you to speak to the rock. And you'll get water. And Moses didn't do what God wanted him to do. And he struck it and he said, Moses took his rod and hit the rock. Other than that, it's, he just got out of God's will and didn't do what God told him to do. God said, all right, you do it your way. Paid for that. It changed immediately. It scared him. Never was the same rod. Three things. Now let me go back to you and me. God asked Moses, said, what is that in thy hand? He said, it's a rod. I'm asking you tonight, and God's asking you tonight, what is that in your hand? Not talking about abilities, not talking about talents, not talking about organizational skills, nothing. What is, and yet, you, or you may have all those things, you may have never have none of those things. I've talked to people said, Brother Gabriel, I'd like to do something with God, but I don't have any gifts, I don't have any, you everybody's got a gift, but they say, I don't have anything, I don't know what God could do with me. I, doesn't make any difference whether you've got all the gifts and all the abilities that a man could possibly have, or if you don't have any of them, you've got one thing in your hand tonight that you're holding, and you've got the free will to do with it what you want to do. What is that in your hand? It's your life. God said, that's what I want. That's what I want. You see, we can give God our abilities without giving Him our life, but we can't give Him our life without giving Him our abilities. So God said, what's that in your hand? It's your life. God said, I want you to bring it and put it on the altar. Y'all understand tonight, you hold your life in your hand? Now you're saved, you've been born again, but God gave you a free will. And He won't override it. You can be saved and He not be Lord of your life. You still go to heaven when you die, but you go empty-handed. But if you want to be blessed of God and you want to be used of God, God says, what's that in your hand? He said, it's your life. And He said, I want you to come by faith. And I want you to kneel somewhere at an altar or by your bed, it doesn't matter, and take your life out of your hand and you put it over in my hand and you turn loose of it and you let me do what I, what I want to. There's probably people here tonight you'd say, Brother Gambrell, I, I've done that. I hope you have. I did it. I did it. 
Back when I was in the early 30s, I was a Sunday school teacher. I was chairman of the missions committee. I was deacon, Thrift Haven Baptist Church. I was distribution manager for Mohawk Tire Rubber Company. I had a good job, and I loved Mohawk Tire Rubber Company, and I had an expense account, and I had, I mean, I had a good job. And I loved it. I went out there and spent 10, 15, 20 hours a day sometimes when we first opened that new distribution center. My life was, I was in church, I was faithful, I went visitation, I won people to Christ. I did all these things that, that I got involved in, but my life was really over here at Mohawk Tire Rubber Company. And I don't know how many times, four, five, six, seven times during a preaching service, God touched my heart. I'd go down and kneel at the altar and I'd say, God, here's my life. I just want to give it to you. I went down there one time. I never will forget Pete Stillman, our pastor, came down, put his arm around. We were good friends and I was crying. He said, Brother Kimbrell, why'd you come? I said, oh, Brother Pete, I just came want to give my life to God. He said, that's good. That's good. I got a pat on the back. I went back and sat down. You know what? Number one, I wasn't changed. Number two, it didn't scare me. And number two, I went right on with my same life. You know why? When I knelt there and gave my life to God, I got up, I picked it up by the head. And when I went back and sat down in my seat, I still knew I had the last word. Didn't scare me a bit. But I remember the day, like it happened yesterday, that God spoke to my heart. And I knelt around that order, and I said, God, here's my life. It's yours. Whatever. When I stood up, I picked it up by the tail, and all of a sudden, I was changed. I didn't give a flip about Mohawk Tire Rubber Company on the way back to my seat. I didn't care what happened to it. By the time I got back there and sat down, reality set in, and it scared me. The devil got right here and said, boy, you messed up now. I said, you're right, I messed up. I was in control, now I'm not. And I didn't know where God was. If you'd have told me God was going to lead me to be a preacher, go to the mission field, and be where I am today, I'd have been so scared I'd have run. Never dreamed of anything like that. But you know, from that day, number one, it changed. Number two, it scared me. Never had been in that place before in my Christian life where I took my hands totally off. And I thank God God had a plan. But that rod was never the same again. Brother Dale, you've heard this. Somebody come in all excited and they're telling you about something. They say, oh, Brother Coffee, you know, this happened today and I was down here in a certain place and something happened down here. Boy, I was just right there and I, God was able to use me. I could help these people. They said, just by coincidence, I was right there in the right place. No, no, no. You don't have no coincidences after you take your leg to give your life to God, take your hands off of it, pick it up by the tail. You become the rod of God. And you're at this place one day and God uses you, and you're at another place the next day and God uses you. And you become the rod of God, and you're never the same again. Now I've got away. I hadn't been obedient to God everything. I, I had to grow in grace. What is that in your hand tonight? It's your life. What's your life going to amount to? Let me say this. It does not depend upon God what your life amounts to. God said, my eyes, he said, the eyes of the Lord run to and throw throughout the country looking for a man that I can show himself strong, myself strong on his behalf. God said, I'll do my part. If you give me your life and take your hands off of it, what will your life amount to tonight? It depends upon you. Number one, are we willing to make a right choice and say, I want the will of God more than the world? And have you given God your attention every day and say, God, speak to me? Whatever it is, I don't care. And at some time, some place, have you take your life, knelt down somewhere and did business with God and said, here it is, God, taking my hands off of each year as you do whatever you want to with it. That's the difference in whether, you, now you're free tonight, you understand that? You, you, God gave you free will. You're there tonight and you hold your hand, you hold your life in your hand. When we have an invitation in a few minutes, you got one of two choices. You can take your life in your hand, turn that way and go out the back door and probably be happy, be faithful. But you say, I'm gonna keep my life. 
or you can take your life and you can come here and kneel around his front bench or somewhere and go home tonight and say, here's my life, God, I'm giving it to you, I'm taking my hands off. You take my life and do anything you want to with me. If you do that, God says, I'll take it. And it doesn't matter whether you've got abilities or no abilities. God said, I'll change it, I'll mold it, I'll make it. And I'll change you from Moses' rod to the rod of God. And God will use you and you'll look back and be amazed over what God's done with your life. But that's where the blessings of God must start. A choice between the world and the will of God. Give God your attention every day and give your life to God and take your hands off of it. And you'll be amazed. Now before we stand, let me just give you one illustration that will show you. Back in the old country, England, years ago, they had a church service just like this. And I don't know what the message was, but it was about giving your life to God. They did things a little different in those days. They took the offering at the end of the service. After the service was there and a man had been challenged to give his life to God, the ushers came forward, took the plates, and started down the aisles. There was a little boy sitting about halfway down the aisle on this side over here. They say, got a picture of it. Sitting right on the end, 12 years old. He was a faithful little boy. He was serious. He wasn't a prankster. Everybody knew him. Grew up there. When the usher got to him, the little boy looked up and said, Sir, would you set the offering plate over on the floor? And he thought it was a strange request, but he knew the little boy was not a prankster. So he bent over and set the offering plate down. That little 12-year-old boy reached down and slipped his shoes off and stood up and stepped over to that offering plate. What was he doing? He's saying, it's all I got, God, but I'll give it to you. That young man's name was Robert Moppet. Robert Moppet was David Livingston's father-in-law. The two of them together pioneered Africa. They built the bridges and cut the roads and won hundreds and thousands of black people that are in heaven tonight because one little boy said, it's all I got. Stand to your feet, every head bowed, every eye closed.